Good. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So title of the session is, Shouldn't All of Your Storage Be Highly Available? My name is Greg Huff. I'm the CTO for LSI. And let me go ahead and get started here. So what we're going to do is first off just go a little bit about uh, LSI, a bit of detail for those of you that may not be familiar with us. Uh, we're going to talk about the need for highly available storage. There's actually a lot of things changing in the way people deploy that are driving up the need for HA. Uh, much, many more servers today could use it if it was affordable than in the past. We're going to talk about a new HA paradigm, a different way to solve this problem than it's historically been solved. We're going to talk about shared DAS as a solution to this. We're going to introduce a product, go over what the deployment models could look like with this new product, and then a call to action. So if you look at LSI, we're really the leaders of direct attached storage, right? So the very first SCSI controller, various generations of RAID, single chip, RAID on chip, tracking the technology transitions, first person through all the ultra speed grades, 160, 320, first person to do serial attached SCSI, track it through the speed grades, six gig, 12 gig. Uh, and as you'll see, that's really paid off an installed base. So we're in about 60% of the servers that are installed. So if you go to IDC Gartner, they'd say the installed base of servers sitting out there is around 36 million. It's probably a little higher than that because they tend to believe that things get rolled over on quicker cycles than, uh, than we believe. But it's, it's in the 36 to 40 million kind of installed base range. And based on our shipments, over 21 million in the last three years, probably about roughly two thirds of the servers out there use our technology for uh, the full solution stack. So the SaaS ports itself, the RAID data protection stack, our drivers, our firmware. And today, nine out of the top 10 actually depend on us in for in, end to end for their solution. And the one that doesn't use us uses our silicon in some places and some of their own RAID software and others. So we're very ubiquitous. Uh, you, you can hardly escape LSI if you own a server is basically the conclusion you should reach. So universal need, let's talk about what's changing where people will almost certainly have a greater need for HA and shared storage than they have in the past. A uh, lot more people have more needs for uninterrupted uptime. Basically just either they have an online presence that they didn't have previously, they have applications that are line of sight to customer satisfaction or revenue generation that they can't afford to take offline, they have a lot of data that they've got regulatory guidelines, um, and virtualization, another big area. Uh, if I bet if I did a survey of the audience, the number of people that had VMs five years ago versus today, it'd be dramatic, right? How many more? And you know, people want agility in a VM. They, they want things like the ability to, to move a VM from one server to another, for it to have a consistent view of its storage, regardless of where it's running. Um, and they actually uh, you know, also want a lot of density. So, the processor complex has grown at a much greater rate than storage over the last four or five years. So if you look at the expansion in hard drives, uh, the, the capacity has been high, the performance has not been, it's been a slow curve, but processors and memory have been on a, a really dramatic curve, right? Multi-core, high frequency, one to two to three to four memory channels per socket, uh, just a lot more computing capability, but not really a lot more storage capability to go along with it. Uh, flash acceleration has helped that a lot, but nothing has really gone after the idea of sharing or HA. There's been no real forward progress other than the standard models. And so if you look at the existing models that are there, they really only serve about half the market. So if I'm a traditional large IT, I'm going to use a SAN. Right? No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It might be iSCSI, it might be fiber channel, but if I'm an enterprise kind of company and I'm fairly large scale, you're absolutely going to find multiple SANs inside my infrastructure. If I'm a cloud guy, whether it's public, private, uh, but I'm selling either infrastructure as a service or I'm you know, something higher level like search, social networking, et cetera, as a service over the internet, I typically use multi-way replication, right? two to five copies across different geographies, and that's how I solve this problem. But neither one of those answers are actually really good for half the market. 
So if you look at small, medium companies or remote office, branch office of big companies, those answers aren't really the best. And, and I'll give a, a personal example on this. So the, the general practitioner that I go to, our family doctor, it's actually a very large practice. It's, it's 10 or 12 doctors. They've got five or six nurse practitioners. They've got an equivalent size staff that does booking, insurance processing. It's, you know, it's a pretty good size company. And I actually asked them once and went and looked back in the back room because every exam room and station is, you know, Microsoft thin client solution. If I go in the back, there's two nice beefy 2U servers, SAN switches, uh, kind of price band three, sort of external storage SAN, pair of ethernet switches, and then it all fans out. And they basically found a VAR that deals in medical record systems to put it together for them. And they kind of admitted they paid 40, 45K for all the gear. Well, they can afford that kind of overhead, right? $45,000 was a rational expense for a company of that size with, with 12 doctors. But, but what if they were half the size? What if it was an office with two dentists? What if it was a shoe store? What if it was, there, there's no way they can afford that kind of overhead, right? And so the availability solution for that small SAN works great for their size, but if you go much smaller than that, they're really sort of denied an answer. Uh, you, you end up with no HA, and then you take the risk on you know, business continuity. Um, you know, anybody ever been to their doctor's office when their system wasn't working, right? And seen how absolutely brutal of an experience that was. They, they can't tell what your prescriptions are when they last saw you, your history of blood pressure, they're writing everything down manually, they run two hours late, it's awful, right? And so that's really what we're going after with this initial product is partnering uh, Microsoft and LSI to go after HA and sharing for the half of the market that's underserved, they paid more than they needed to, or unserved, can't afford to get into this kind of solution at all. And what we're going to argue is that a shared DAS solution is uh, a very applicable one in, in many ways. So if you look at single server, which is what people are used to, uh, you know, you can absolutely get robust data protection. We're going to get a little later about you know, LSI's history with data protection, uh, RAID and various technologies, et cetera. Uh, you can get very high performance, you can get low cost, and you can get easy management. That's what's part of people's lives today. Um, and normally when you think about sharing an HA, now you've got, you know, many of those things go away. You have much higher cost, sometimes prohibitive, depending upon what problem you're trying to solve. Easy management doesn't happen, right? There's SAN switches to manage, external arrays to manage. Every vendor has their own set of tools for that, tying the eventing together and the setup together. It's just very difficult. And, you know, SANs are performance problematic, right? You're pushing all the media and the performance in the media across a relatively thin wire and an HBA to get to it. Uh, it's, it's much more of a challenge than something like DAS, which has PCI as an interconnect and really high bandwidth and, and low power, right? So what we're going to talk about is taking a lot of the positive attributes on the left, low cost, high performance, easy management, robust data protection, and extending that to enable sharing and continuous application availability. And so we've got a product that we've announced this week uh, as part of our presence here at TechEd, which is called Synchro CS. And effectively what it is is a robust, cost-effective way to deploy and manage HA for small and medium business. Uh, and you'll see a couple of other use cases beyond that one. We're bringing shared storage and controller failover into the DAS world it is built on technology that uh, you know, we're the market leader of this, two-thirds of the installed base uh, from LSI with Mega Raid, and it's a complete solution under Windows Server 2012. And when we get to complete, we'll, we'll describe what that means a little more. So let's talk about what this thing looks like and how it actually works. So basically what we do is we take two servers, and we'll go through multiple embodiments in this in a minute, but I'll start on this one. So imagine two discrete servers. Doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, um, you know, one U, two U, little half U sleds, I don't care. And you're gonna see a bunch of different people shipping products of all kinds of configurations and, and various levels of complexity. 
And in those servers, I basically put what looks like a standard SAS RAID controller. And then I have an external JBOD with SAS expanders and I cross connect them with relatively low cost copper cables. And so that's what the application looks like. And then what we essentially do, and you know, I may end up uh, branch predicting the slides a little bit here, it is as simple as when you give one server performs a write and that you know, SCSI command comes down through the driver chain and lands on a card, what we actually do is commit it to that card's cache and then we use the SAS interconnect that's normally the data plane to get the data from the drives as sort of an IPC mechanism between the two server cards. And so we'll mirror that write through the SAS expander in the JBOD over to the other controller, commit it to his cache, and then once that commit is finished on both, then we'll acknowledge that write up the chain. And so the application or OS, whoever initiated the write, gets a completion and you know that it's block level consistent between the two cards. So effectively what I'm doing is creating cache coherency between two servers using SAS, not only as the data plane to read and write the drives, but also as the communication and synchronization network for the two servers. And uh, it sounds simple, but it's actually you know, pretty brutally difficult to, to make this work in all the corner cases and failure scenarios and recovery modes and all these sorts of things. Um, we actually really like SAS for this because if you look at ways you can interconnect things, SAS is very low uh, cost per bit. You know, if you, if you look at what do I pay for, uh, you know, uh, a bit per second on Ethernet, on InfiniBand, on Fiber Channel, they're all actually fairly high. The lowest cost is PCIe, the second lowest cost is SAS. So it's a really low cost way to interconnect things with very high performance. And we've got years of technology and error recovery on these, uh, you know, making sure that things are enterprise ready and highly available, and tons of hardware uh, that are aimed at accelerating and protecting data on, the, on that technology. So the foundations of this in the server, we essentially have what is our RAID controller. And just wanted to show this so you understand that, that these are, you know, incredibly complex devices these days. 74 million uh, gates, uh, 17 million basically just in the SAS core, 2.7 in RAID data protection engine, 59 megabits of on-chip memory, uh, you know, really a lot of work on the protocol layers for interoperability with all the different drives and SSDs, robust error handling on all the internal arrays, so you know, we can correct, detect and correct anything that could actually accidentally go wrong, uh, tons of bandwidth. And these have actually gotten advanced enough that the, the other ones that we're, we're introducing now, uh, we basically don't, even though there are embedded micros on these things, for the most part, they only get involved in error handling. So, you know, people think of RAID as this thing that before it's like, hey, every now and then it can produce a performance anomaly and, you know, it can get in the way of, uh, you know, performance with solid state, these kinds of things. Today, we basically do RAID 0, 1, 10 reads and writes, 5, 6, 50, 60 reads, all in state machines, right? So, it, it, you know, it, it literally never touches the host processor other than queuing the I.O. or the embedded processor unless there's an error. Uh, the only time that we touch the uh, embedded processor in the normal data flow is a RAID 5 or 6 write. And there it's just the processor checks on the hardware at a few steps to make sure that there's some... Uh, no data hazards like reads passing rights and, and so a few things like that. Uh, but, but very high performance engines uh, and, and a very low power way to basically handle moving data and protecting data. And we'll get later to why that's important. And uh, SAS expander is in many ways as complex as an ethernet switch these days. Uh, you know, very high bisectional bandwidth, 22 gigabytes per second uh, across a relatively modest number of ports, five megabits of on-chip buffering, 14 million gates and uh, handles all the enclosure management, right? Which is boring, but if your LEDs show the wrong thing, you know, uh, or you have to have a separate device to actually manage that, it's, it's not very interesting. So let's talk about the software stack. So we, we talked about hardware and how this welds together. And this was actually a really long partnership and a two and a half, three year development effort with Microsoft so parallel definition and development, joint validation and hardening, 
and the joint validation and hardening, I'll tell you, was a, was a long, hard road. Uh, it, it actually is phenomenally complex to get this to work with all the different corner cases of what's happening and what fails and, and to really get this robust and is something that people can trust. Uh, it does leverage, and we'll get into a slide here in a minute, uh, the driver and, and management uh, work that we've done for years, but is also enhanced. So one of the things that's a real brag about this is you can go in through standard Microsoft tools, not having to touch any piece of software from LSI at all or any other management framework, go to one server in the pair and have HA up and running in under 30 minutes only touching Microsoft tools, right? And so this is pretty unprecedented versus what you would have to do in a, a traditional external storage environment, especially if you're at a larger shop. Uh, and this is all controlled by the server admin. So if you're a server guy and you don't really enjoy calling and booking with the SAN guy to get the SAN switch configured and then the array guy to get your LUNs carved out and the worldwide names and the, you know, this is one-stop shopping for you, right? You can basically enable shared storage entirely within a server administrator's purview and move forward and make it go fast using tools and frameworks you already know without having to get anything else involved in your ecosystem at all. And so that was a significant enhancement. It took a lot of work by both companies to get this to work. And as I said, was built upon our, our sort of industry leading uh, SaaS and data protection layer, but with additional capabilities added for cache coherency cluster and failover. And then, uh, so there's a firmware layer and a host software layer, and we'll drill into those a little bit as well. So on the host software side, you'll see we've got three color codes here. Uh, green is LSI unchanged. You know, the teal orange color is uh, Microsoft and the blue uh, green is LSI that was changed. And so the Windows Server 2012 provides the failover and cluster management capabilities. So we don't get into trying to manage the cluster or manage the servers. We're just providing storage ecosystem under it. It's the same tools for managing a Windows cluster you would normally do. What we do is the clustered storage system underneath it. Our um, you know, driver management suite, so boot and pre-boot, as I said, we seamlessly integrated all this stuff. So it's all in the box, you know, drivers and tools where there's nothing that you need to add or layer on to make this work. It's literally you know, buy the correct SKU cards, attach the cables to the JBOD, and there's nothing else in the host software load that needs to change at all. And as I mentioned earlier, the under 30 minutes is just a, a huge benefit right, uh, c compared to what we've got today. As we tested this with, with customers and went through the TAP program, we got amazing feedback on that. And then firmware, uh, essentially all the core modules, how we queue in queue, in queue and DQIOs, manage enclosures, do event tracking, do the basic data protection layers, all that stuff green, completely unchanged. Uh, we did have to go add three new sections here. So one is uh, pretty dramatic changes to cache management, adding an entire function for coherency. I mentioned that earlier, how we replicate writes uh, across and then maintain those shared volumes. Cluster support, which is things like, um, you know, you gotta figure out, you have a peer, right, that I am in an HA config. Uh, you have to handle things like if there's a drive failure, which one of us is in charge of rebuilding if we're both still alive and there's a drive failure in a shared array, which one of us is gonna take the lead on the rebuild of the failed drive. You know, you gotta have a bunch of code to sort that sort of thing out. And then failover support, you know. Once we are in a degraded condition, you know, how do we basically handle that, right? How do I consume the other guy's logical drives, physical drives? Uh, the heartbeat over SAS to know that we are failed or alive. Uh, quite a bit of new code in, in those blocks to make this all work. So we talked earlier about the complexity of the hardware, and, and I guess I would say there's, there's a million other ways to skin this cat, right? There's been vSAN software-only products standalone in the industry for years. There's Microsoft Spaces, which is uh, you know, a, a great product. Uh, that, that has a lot of capability and is a lot more robust than a lot of the things we've seen in the past. But we, we still would argue that having infrastructure in, in place to go do this has a lot of value. So 
One is just simply performance. You know, if you've got RAID 5 or RAID 6, those are actually incredibly intense data movement operations. So uh, we could get into some Q&A later if you're interested, but uh, a RAID 5 write can actually turn across reads and writes generating the parity, you know, et cetera, into about a 12x multiple of what you move. So if you give me a block of n size, I'm basically going to end up you know, doing 12 times that amount of read or write in a lot of situations. Uh, and if you're doing that on the host processor, that's all memory bandwidth that's competing with the hypervisor, the VMs, et cetera. Uh, another one people often don't think about is cache pollution, right? So cache residency is a major determinant of application performance. And if I have basically got the storage layer, um, you know, polluting the cache with its traffic, as it's manipulating the blocks, generating the parity, et cetera, then you know, that's pretty invasive and could cause some real performance anomalies. Uh, it's one of those things that, that's not very fun to, uh, to, to diagnose, right? That you, you had these VMs that performance went in the toilet because the storage layer polluted the cache. Good luck figuring that one out, right? Uh, with, with sort of the hardware data protection, all that stuff gets isolated. Uh, there's a separate uh, memory bus, uh, a separate controller, uh, battery back non-volatile, which is you know, very difficult to get in a, in a host DRAM, where all that stuff's isolated and it never interferes with you know, what's going on in the OS, what's going on with the hypervisor, the VMs, or the applications inside of them. It's just completely firewalled away. So you never get anomalous performance and all those gates, that hardware, that complexity we've done over the years does basically you know, add to performance and resiliency and data protection. So the second is just enterprise robustness, platform independence. Um, we do insulate the data from you know, anything that can happen away. So once you give us a write and you get it committed, I don't care what the OS does, the platform does, the application does, I'm gonna be able to give you that block back, right? And that's a very difficult thing to say in a lot of the other models of the way to do this that regardless of what choices you make in the future, no matter what, under all circumstances, no matter what change you make, uh, you know, how you think about the quality of various levels of your solution, that if we give you a command completion, you're gonna get the data back, no matter what. And so that is a, a huge thing. Uh, and then second, you know, we, we are really good at the HA side of this, right? The storage is tremendously complex. The ecosystem's really con condensed down over the years. And the number of places that cable pulls, drive pulls, power, power fails, firmware errors on drives, firmware errors on expanders, uh, you know, tape is a nasty animal, libraries are nasty animals. Uh, solid state is very different than rotational and chases out new bugs. And then when you mix all this stuff together and have solid state and rotational in a common solution, it's just really complex to get this stuff to work. And uh, over the years, you know, this is kind of a 30-year, 25-year generationally hardened solution that, that knows how to deal with that stuff. And then enterprise capabilities, you know, bootable. You know, it's kind of a pain in the butt to have uh, one set of storage infrastructure for the data plane, but to have to have an entire other controller drive, set of drives, just to get the server up and running to get to the point you can use that other stuff. Uh, you know, we, we deal with all this seamlessly, boot volumes, data volumes, um, large drive pools. So I think Synchro's 96 drives, yeah, okay. Uh, 96 drives, you know, up to four terabytes a piece, so very large storage pools, uh, rotational and flash. And then once again, just all common stuff that's leveraged and, and very hardened. So even though there's lots of ways to solve this problem, uh, we're going to argue that you know it's it's worth having a device in the past to make this work. So I, I talked about my doctor's office and them admitting that they spent forty five thousand uh, dollars, you know, on their back end infrastructure. We kind of did a generic build up here and said, okay, application servers and OSs that that's sort of a wash. And by the way, this is an average. I, I won't even get into who we looked at, but server take one or two guys, build up configs, average the prices. External storage, price band three, one or two guys, build up the config, average the prices. So this isn't any one vendor. It's kind of a composite based on list prices before discount for everything. Um, 
you know, in one case, you've got our synchro kit. In another case, you've got iSCSI nick and boot drives. In our case, you've got a JBOD. In the SAN case, you don't. But in the SAN case, you've got an external storage. In ours, you don't. Data drives were made a wash, but really that's generous of us because normally per gigabyte, the drives in the external storage cost a hell of a lot more than the ones in the JBOD. Uh, SAN vendors charge a premium per gigabyte versus what you could just buy as a, as a JBOD drive. So a wash is being a little generous. And then switch infrastructure, we don't have one. We use the expander in the drive tray as the switch. Uh, there you have to have, uh, we're, we made this one iSCSI so it would be cheaper, assuming you, know, you already need an ethernet switch so you don't have an ethernet switch and a fiber channel switch. Uh, so this is as generous to the SAN as you can get. iSCSI, leverage in my ethernet switch. And basically you'll see that the total solution, 37 versus 21, uh, doing it our way is about two thirds the cost and the storage specific is about one third the cost, right? So definitely a lower cost way to solve this problem. And interestingly, higher performance as well. And so I'm not gonna defend any one of these bars as, a, as an absolute value because everyone in here is smart enough to know read write mix, workload size, I mean block size, cacheability versus not, you know, your mileage way vary. But what I'll say generally is single server DAS storage controller is, you know, the highest performing, right? I've got a BI8 PCI Express Gen 3. I've got, uh, you know, eight lanes of six or 12 gig SAS. I basically can map any of the bandwidth or IOPS in the media back into the host because I'm doing everything on state machines in the controller, reads and writes equally fast. This is sort of the gold standard for uh, performance of getting whatever performance is in the, the SSD or the HDD mapped through a driver up into the OS to applications, file systems, et cetera, right? So I'll go the other direction, SAN. SAN traditionally, you know, is a substantially lower performing solution than DAS, you know, but people tolerate it because, you know, you get sharing and HA that you don't get with DAS. And so when you need sharing or HA, the performance challenges you have with a SAN of, you know, I've got a controller pair and I've got storage behind it and I've got, you know, one or 10 gig ethernet or four or eight gig fiber channel coming out the front um, and, and that, that controllers and that relatively thin link back to the host becomes a bottleneck for certain operations, right? The synchro thing's kind of in the middle. So what I would say is reads are very much like the left column of single server DAS, that those are pretty unencumbered. Writes are, have a performance overhead due to that mirroring to the opposite server. And so it, it's, you know, we sort of said, hey, there's a, a, about a 15% penalty on average uh, versus just DAS to do shared DAS and then uh, for the coherency and mirroring. And then you step down again to SAN because, you know, I'm not doing DMA over PCI. I'm doing enqueued packets over narrow fiber channel or ethernet links and it's just substantially slower. So in other words, what we're saying is this is faster and cheaper, which usually, you know, is a good thing. And so the, the idea of bringing low radius sharing, so it's I'm not trying to do what a SAN can do, we're not trying to replace a SAN universally. You know, I can't with this configuration go after, uh, you know, 60 hosts that are, you know, hosted off some iSCSI SAN in what I'm describing here, right? I can't, I can't do that. Uh, I'm, I'm going after essentially dyadic pairs right, which is a lot of applications. But, uh, okay, well, I'm two slides ahead. So there, well, there's roadmap. So we'll, 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 we'll I'll bring that up in Q&A and we'll talk about that. But, but let me show you an interim solution that maybe solves a lot of problems for that. So there are two deployment models for this that you're gonna see. So there's gonna be a lot of products announced this week. Uh, here at TechAd, and I think some of them will be, even be out on the show floor. Uh, but essentially, there's the one I described earlier, 
which is two servers, RAID cards, cabled to a JBOD. The second one is there's actually quite a few companies that are packaging this up all as a cluster in a box. So one, there's several advantages of this, right? It does everything the one on the left does, but one, there's an, an easier uh, sort of deployment. If I you know, don't want to get it cabled incorrectly, it takes up less rack space. But you know, more importantly, there's a significant infrastructure reduction. So in the one on the left, I've got three sets of redundant hot swappable power supplies. I've got three sets of redundant hot swappable fans. I've got discrete cables to hook everything up. You know, I've got probably at least four U, if not six U, tied up in doing that. And there's just a lot more sort of complexity to deal with. The cluster in a box ones, it's one set of all the redundant components, two servers and a JBOD all in one form factor, right? Two to four U. Uh, two to five U, actually. I think there'll be a five U one out on the floor today. And so just really a, a very simple thing to deploy, right? It's like the, the, the SAN in a box with the servers that are going to consume it. And so let, let's get to that. Uh, okay, I'm still one slide ahead. Man, I'm not knowing my deck very well today. So, and, and really where the cluster in a box is could be huge is remote office, branch office, right? So if you think of you know, uh, every state farm office, every Home Depot store, every CVS, pharmacy, Walgreens. So th think of the big corporations that basically have to have IT at every local point of presence that they have for, you know, pricing database, run the point of sale terminals, video and security applications. This is very common to have two to four servers uh, and some external storage in sort of every store or, or presence location. And we think these cluster in a box things are just gonna be huge for that kind of deployment model. Uh, just a, a real lever of simplicity and capability for people. So this is where I was going with your question. So what if I take this solution and I pair it up with Windows Storage Server, right? So there, there's actually been a lot of work and, and there'll be some, uh, some, some additional sessions on this topic as well, that if I take that two node pair and I run Windows Storage Server on top of it, and now rather than I am the, conserve, the, the two servers consuming the blocks locally in that domain, now I'm essentially creating storage services on a network to other servers to use and host VMs, right? Uh, or just consume generally. Right, you must still only have two pairs That's correct, right. I, today we can only have dyadic pairs talking to them over SAS, but once again, look up one more layer and look at the solution at the bottom. You know, you would really struggle to find something. I mean, everything Microsoft has done with making the, the two servers with SMB, with the storage server performance, and then you put this sort of plumbing underneath that so those two servers have a consistent view of the, the blocks at a, a SAS PCI level. It's extremely high performance, uh, very capable and robust, and then you know, go compare that to any other offering in the market. It's, it's, you're gonna find it's sort of a disruptive capability at the, at the price points, right? And so this is the second one is, you know, you, you basically use this not to consume the blocks, but to serve the blocks up on a fabric. Okay, the how do I get started slide. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of products that are gonna be announced this week. Uh, people that gave us permission to put logos up but not talk about the products are listed on this slide because um, they don't uh, essentially want thunder stolen here. So there's a lot of embargoes that in today or tomorrow around lunchtime. And so you'll, you'll see a lot of um, you know, products on the floor and, and press announcements. But this is something that, that you should generally assume will be broadly available. So you know, any of the partners you go to today to procure your infrastructure, they're gonna be able to sell you this synchro solution with Server 2012 as a a bundled product that you can buy and consume. Uh, and I can tell you there's a couple of pretty important logos that are missing from this one that we'll be announcing uh, relatively quickly as well. So they're not announcing this week, they're just not quite close enough to launch, but you can look and see what names are missing and guess who the, the one or two others are gonna be, right? 
and then there are solution builder partners, right? Um, so we, we've got uh, we've cultivated a, a set of friends here, some of which in the room, uh, to to basically work and build these solutions. If uh, tier one isn't your game, or you want a you know a, a partner that basically brings more capability to the table than just uh, you know sort of processing the order, and if you're really aggressive uh, or, or large scale and want to buy tested enclosures and build the solution up yourself by any old server, our channel card kit, and uh, you know, JBODs, we have a list of validated solutions that are out there as well. So there's you know, any way to get this you want. Uh, SISB guys, build it yourself guys, tier one OEM guys, we tried to make this as, as broad and generally available as we possibly can. So you know, the, the close from us is, you know, there's sort of a, a new way to look at sharing and availability that uh, if you're willing to give up some radius, brings a lot more performance and lower cost. It's a joint development between Microsoft and LSI over two and a half, three years, very integrated end-to-end, -end, tested, validated, simple to manage and deploy solution. Uh, and that this is something that we're gonna continue as a, as a focused investment area the idea of shared DAS and expand capabilities pretty dramatically over time. So if you want to know more, uh, we have a booth, uh, 1602 out on the floor. Uh, we have a session tonight, uh, actually today, uh, 1230 to 2 at our booth. Uh, ask the experts tonight, 630 to 830. And then John, raise your hand. Uh, John Laval from Microsoft is doing a session tomorrow. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel, but in room 261. So 10, 10, 15 to 11.30 tomorrow. And so, as usual, I ran way under on time. So we've got buckets of time for Q&A if you guys want to know more. Yes, sir? Is there a single point of failure anywhere in the cluster of box? I so remember, there's going to be multiple cluster in a boxes, and everybody's implementation is different, but there certainly will be ones out there that there will be the only thing that's shared won't have active components, right? So, um, okay, how do I say this another way? There's a big, so if I have a board that's routing traces, that could be shared between the two domains, but if it's got no active components on it, its chance of failure is very low. That's a lot different than if I put, you know, the SAS expander singly on that and there isn't another one or some power conversion that isn't redundant and, or something like that, right? So uh, many years ago I used to do superdomes and we, we got into this, uh, you know, what's, what's a multi-partition failure domain, single partition failure domain? It's very expensive to do something that has no shared components at all um, and it really prices you out of the market, but no shared components, but with no active components, basically just boards and press fit connectors and stuff, that's generally considered as acceptable. And you will see some of them have that attribute that the only things that are shared between the domains that aren't redundant and hot swappable are passives. So, but everybody that designed the solution, they designed it their own way. Some made different trade-offs than others. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm not going to comment on roadmap today uh, uh, of that sort of thing, but generally our RAID cards today support Solaris through everything you can imagine. So it's a uh, you know it, it's a possibility that will come in the future. Uh, it will be something to do with. No, no, no. Actually, SATA drives work on SAS channels. So right now, there's something called SCSI persistent reservation that's only available in SAS. That's not in SATA. But uh, for rotational, there are things that are basically SAS to SATA bridges that make SATA drives look like SAS drives to the. Uh, to the controller, 
and some OEMs actually package those on some little paddle cards, some put them on the back plane. So I think you will see solutions in the market that don't care if the drive is SAS or SATA because they've added a little protocol bridger, right? Is that important to you? By the way, we love feedback. Okay. SATA, right. 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 So it, it needs to look like a SAS drive to our controller because we do use the persistent reservation thing, but there are more than one way to skin that cat and we, we you know, there are absolutely going to be products in the market that will enable SATA drives. Just a matter of time. Yes, sir. Uh, so essentially what we have is eight lanes of six gig SAS, and if we're reading, we can saturate those. If we're writing, it's about a 15% overhead penalty that we pay because it's just, we, we have to mirror the rights to the opposite cache, right? I, I think at a high level, that's the way to look at it. And, and once again, there's no workload in the world other than, than a synthetic that's that clean, right? You know, yeah, basically iometer is the only thing that will ever generate anything that look like that. Real workloads, you know, especially in a, a virtualized environment, which we think is a huge target for this. Each VM is going to be doing its own thing, and it's all going to look pseudo-random by the time it gets to the controller. And so, you know, even if you got four things doing straight sequential, by the time they get down to the controller, it looks pseudo-random. And so you you know, the, your, your mileage will vary, but, but what we can say is you're going to do better in this kind of architecture than you'll do on a SAN from a performance perspective by a long shot. And the overhead of the sharing and having those volumes be across two, two servers is in the order of magnitude of 15% versus having it only on one server and not shared accessible by a second. I think that's the high level story we're trying to say. We, we do, right. So uh, uh, eventually, so part of that cache management policy, uh, uh, at some point things get cast out of the cache and written back down to the actual spindles. No, no, no. We, we can even do like RAID 6 volume. So let, let, me, let me give you an example. Uh, part of that cache management thing, I take a write, I write it to my cache, the pair's cache, and then at some point when the policy says you should be the block cast out so something else has room in the cache, you know, one of the two cards, if they're both alive, owns writing that, you know, creating the RAID 6 parity stripe for that block and writing it to the disks. And then once he's done that and we know it's resident RAID 6 on the disks, he tells the other guy, free that block up in your cache too, right? So that it's... Correct, absolutely. What, what you have to have is block level consistency, right? That you, you absolutely know on a block by block basis that they, the two servers have exactly the same view of the cache and the disks. Everything. Yes, sir. Yes, right, right. But, but I mean, I think this all works through like the story, the disk manager, you know, oh, okay. yeah. Uh, let me get the guy behind you who hasn't had one yet. I don't actually know the answer to that question.
Yeah. So, Rick, do we actually fail the drive? Um, that I, that I, don't know. I, I don't think, I think that we might be miscommunicating on the documentation. I don't think that there's a green list of drives and if the drive isn't on it that we fail to use it. I don't, I don't think that's what happens. Okay. I'm to the 99th percentile sure that's not what happens. Okay. Well, uh, honestly, think. Th so, so it, it's it's truly almost impossible to do something like a green list, right? Because it would have to be in firmware, and so I'd be doing a firmware release monthly as new drives came out. You know, Dell validates some new Hitachi thing, and but they got to do a storage controller firmware to get it just it doesn't make any sense right so it's it's never been a concept of a green list red list kind of thing it, I, I don't think it cares we're just listing what we have done pretty exhaustive testing with jbods and drives right yes sir So we're, we're layered under all that. I, I don't think we care, right? We're, we're, we're nested under any choices you make around SMB. Yes, sir. Tony, we have pretty extensive performance prioritization. Yeah, so I think we have 5, 6, 50, 60, various width stripes, 0, 1, 10. I think we have very broad performance data that's available from us on just standard cards. So uh, raise your hand, Tony. Come see this guy when we close, and he'll tell you how to find all that. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Some board guys over here. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll uh, we'll finish early and let you start the long walk to your next session. <laughs>